Hello and welcome to another episode of Table Talk, R&D for Greater RP. Today's episode is on prep. Do you want too much? Do you want too little? How do you feel about improv? We're going to talk about that, the pros, the cons, the possibility of screw-up on today's episode. I hope you like it. Please, what are your thoughts on improv DMing and, and how good is it, how strong is it, when is it a good idea, yada yada and all that. Oh, well... I guess improv DMing is best when you're kind of in between major plot points. Uh, I guess even if you don't have a major plot point going, Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great. You end up just creating situations that never would have been otherwise. Some of my best uh, sessions have been just pure improv. Awesome. Me, me too. Uh, I, I think some of my worst sessions have also been improv, but oh, yeah. the ratio of good to bad is yeah. it's worthwhile. Excellent. Uh, the the I tend to take things. I, I tend to make scenarios that I, that I can solve. There is a solution to usually more than a couple, um, but those mm-hmm. solutions almost never end up happening because if. If one of the guys, say they're in a room, right, and one of the guys is like, well, is there, is there, I don't know, a barrel or something? If they're in a warehouse or something, that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing that's in that room. I didn't consider the existence of a barrel, but yeah, sure, there's a barrel. So I just don't, I don't, I pretend that I just didn't tell them there was a barrel. I don't say things like, let's say there is. I say, yeah, there's a barrel in the left corner of the room. (laughs) But I totally lied <laughs> for, for, yeah. the, for their yeah. benefit. So uh, w- what for you is a major plot point? Like, why improv in the middle and not all the time? Um, well, major plot points normally, for me at least, uh, revolve around a specific villain. Okay. Um, or event, I suppose. But normally around a person, just because... I think it's very interesting to build up a character and then have the uh, PCs explore that character and their motives. Right. Um, and I think if you have a pre-planned villain, that it sort of just comes about better if you're not improv the entire time. Uh, the BBEG of one of my campaigns has been in the works for, I think, two years now. Um I've been foreshadowing him the entire time, uh, and when the players finally got the big reveal, they were just blown away. Because now, most of the time, what I do is improv DMing. Like, it's just sort of on the fly. But seeing that I had built it up and built the entire world around this character, it, that was just something amazing to them. And that was an amazing feeling. That's awesome. I bet. When when you say you foreshadowed this character, does it, does that do, what does that mean? Does that mean they were physically present, like they were the shopkeep the whole time? Their deeds were present all the time. How how present were they? Well, this BBEG in particular is the leader of the entire continent. Um, he has created the laws, and he has been alive for five hundred years. Wow! Um, and he's a He's a pretty evil character. Uh, there have been large events in the world that have uh, occurred, such as uh, a sundering of the elemental planes that are beginning to influence the prime material plane, um, and just various laws that have suddenly been flipped on their head, and the evolution of an entirely new religion that is based on him. Um, is just little things like that that pop up here and there. And when they finally heard the name of the BBEG, they're like, oh, this is all making sense now. Awesome. So uh, a friend of mine and I did a interview, an episode of this, where he uh, he's a big, big fan of lots and lots of prep. He has pages of prep that he then narrows down to like a paragraph, right, for in each individual sit down. But he has lots of prep. He's got different nations that are moving against each other all the time relatively independent of what the party is doing. He's got just tons and tons of notes, and he is definitely the other end of how I do it. And I love the community because you can have friends like that that disagree with you on everything and then still be great friends. And he would be very, very mad with me if I didn't offer up 
questions from his point of view, um, which I'm going to try to do because I say try because I don't have his point of view. Um, how how do you feel that improv GMing is is an how do, uh, how does it become superior to planning those those moments where you improv and it just it comes out awesome how do you but there are times where they come out horrible how do you justify the risk um well i guess because it's less of a pain in the ass uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just, I just hate preparing, and yeah. I think most of the time, about eighty percent of the time, the uh, the sessions turn out well, regardless of how much preparing I've done. So I, I take a twenty percent chance over three hours of preparing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Here, here's a question that isn't necessarily within the scope of of prepping and not prepping. If, do you ever have players who, whether it's because they have an emotional thing or a previous obligation or something they're thinking about, do you or they're new, do you ever have a player who isn't really in it today? They're not really present at the table, even though they're not necessarily on their phone or something. Oh, absolutely. I've had that. Do you, um, do you think that takes that, away from the overall enjoyment at the table? Um... I think it depends on the player and the character that they're playing. If it is someone who is normally very interactive with the rest of the party, then yeah, I think it does take away a bit. If it's a character that's usually a little more laid back, a little quieter, doesn't always Mm -hmm. jump forward with information first, I think the missing presence isn't as noticeable. Um, And... I don't think that that's an issue. Like when I say it out loud, it sounds like a problem, but I think as long as the players are happy and no one is going, well, this session kind of sucked, I think it's fine. Excellent. So if, if would you would you be willing to share one of your your great improv nights with us? Oh, absolutely. Please. One of my favorite improv sessions. Uh, it was I was actually playing a solo game with oh. a single player. Oh, fun. Um, I love those. And his his city had been overrun uh, by a dragon who wanted to rule it. So the uh, the nobles, like his, his mother, because he was the noble of the city, his mother and her personal bodyguards had fled into the forest. So his quest was to go and find and reunite with his mother. Mm. Um He went out into the forest, found his mother, uh, who had fled out of a secret alleyway, Um, and when he was talking to her, he learned that one of the bodyguards had gone missing, and she was uh, endeared to that bodyguard, so he went to go and find him. Well, at that point, I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I had all planned up until this point, and suddenly there was a bodyguard that had gone missing that I just kind of pulled out of my ass. Now what? Um, right. <laughs> now what? Yeah. So I'm just like, okay, so you go wandering in the direction that you know is supposed to be another rendezvous point, like a secondary rendezvous point. You get there. There's a large stone obelisk. And he's like, okay, what is up with this obelisk? Uh, he casts uh, Comprehend Languages and he starts to read the obelisk. He reads that there is uh, a riddle. Eventually he solves the riddle. As he does so, he's transported into, like, a mirror plane, like a a mirror demi-plane, where the sky is kind of, like, purplish, and the whole area is misty with the same purple color. Uh, He hears a little voice giggling from the forest, and uh, they have a conversation, and it turns out that what he's talking to is a sprite. Um, The sprite is very playful, uh, and it (laughs) tells him that he can find the bodyguard for him uh, as long as he will play a game. Well, oh, fun. He, he, they play, yeah, the bodyguard, who he was, you know, in search of originally. <laughs> so they play this game, and uh, the PC is just like, so are you going to give me the information? And the sprite's like, no, we have to keep playing. Those are the rules. You have to keep playing. He plays, like, three more, like, hide-and-seek games. And eventually he just gets tired of this and tells the sprite to go hide as he wanders around the demi-plane. 
he wanders off into the forest, and I'm just like, okay, besides the bodyguard, what is going to be in this forest? Um, he wanders around, and eventually he finds a tree that is full of, uh, it's a little morbid, but it's full of hanging people. Ooh. And he's like, what is this? So he climbs up the tree, and he cuts down the hanging people. How very he cuts noble. One down. Yeah, right. He, he cuts one down, and the person wakes up and uh, begs for him to give him another piece of cloth so wait, that wait, he wait, can wait. hang himself. The people dead. weren't dead? They were not dead. Love it. <laughs> they Love were, it. Yeah, they were unconscious. Because in that demiplane, you cannot grow old, you do not need to eat, you do not need to breathe, you do not need to sleep. So, so hanging won't kill you, do, right. Exactly. The only thing left to do is to hang yourself until you're unconscious. And so that way, at least, you're not stuck sitting around playing with the sprite for eternity. Right, being incredibly bored forever, right. <laughs> exactly. Love it. He, he eventually cuts everyone down out of the tree uh, and promises to free them if they can help him find the bodyguard. They do so. They spread out into the forest. They find the bodyguard, and they reunite at the obelisk, where the sprite is beginning to become increasingly angry because no one is playing his game. The PC promises to the sprite, if you let me and all of these people go, I will find you new playmates, ones that aren't sleeping all the time. And the sprite's just like, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Right, so right. he lets them all go through the obelisk. Um, and that, that was pretty much the end of that story. The people uh, from the tree spread out into uh, a new era that they had no familiarity with. There were some that were from like 3,000 years ago who just headed out into a, in a panic. Uh, probably dead now, but... <laughs> right, into uh, a world that's completely alien to them. Right. Exactly, yeah. But yeah, so this sprite becomes a reoccurring character throughout the rest of the game. He's come up in three or two years that we've played. Um, at first, he was uh, a villain. Like he he came to uh, like redeem on this debt that the PC had promised him because mm. the PC never came back and gave him new playthings. Um, so he trapped the PC in the demi world again. This is like five months of real game or uh, real world time later. Mm-hmm. Traps the PC again, uh, and the PC makes him a new promise. He says, I can take you out of this demiplane, and you can play with everyone in the world, but you have to inhabit the body of this elk that he had just slain. That, uh, actually, it was a uh, fey lord of the hunt had just slain an elk. Okay. Um, so he puts the... The Fae Lord of the Hunt puts the sprite into the body of the elk, and that's it. The elk is now uh, a sprite and a patron to anyone who wanders through the forest near the PC's home. Hmm. And that a whole so thing was improv? Came, all of that came from a bodyguard that just came out of my ass. <laughs> did he actually find the bodyguard? He did find the bodyguard, yes. Oh, good. Oh, good. Now, this is going to be a way less comfortable question, I, I think. Um, do you have an improv story that's just shit that you'd be willing to share with us? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, it's not super exciting. But uh, essentially, the players were going from town to town because they were going to the next location. Um, I did not have any of the towns prepared. Like, one of them was just, like, a, a minor town. I don't have to prepare for that. Like, you know, you find a few stores, you find a few interesting people. But the next town they went to was, like, like a large, large town. Not really a city, um, but I didn't have anything prepared for that because I didn't think they were going to go there. So I had to improv the whole thing, and essentially it turned out to be two shopping ses- sessions in a row with no story progression. Oof. Yeah, it was just really bad. What, what, two of my favorite improv stories. It happened in the same campaign a couple of game sessions apart. Um, there is this moment where the part, the party comes upon a, a pile of gold, uh, excuse me, a pile of, of, of bear feces with gold coins in it. And, and the guys start immediately digging through the poo to get the gold, which is just gross. But, but they, they, I figured they would, right? So they do. And they discover that, that, that gold, 
Uh, they follow the dung piles, and the piles get bigger, and with it the amount of gold in them. And they eventually account, encounter a bear that is leaking. It's just pooping wherever, and there's gold in the poop. And they follow the bear back to its lair, and they just assume that it must be eating gold or something. So there's got to be, like, a big pile of gold in there. Um, there isn't. The bear is gold. He's, he's made out of it. A, a, a mage has decided that he has a bunch of gold that he doesn't really spend because he can just conjure up things he needs. Why buy things? So, But he has a large pile of gold that he uses for a various alchemical this and that. But he doesn't really want to have to babysit. And he'll forget <laughs> probably where it is, let alone how to keep it safe. So he animates it. He turns this immense pile of gold into a bear. And eventually kind of forgets to maintain the spell. The little 1% of his brain he's dedicating to the spell, he forgot. He spent it on something else. So the spell starts to come undone. And the bear, the gold, takes on the actual mentality of a bear this whole time. Like it wanders through the woods and kills other animals and attacks people who attack it and the whole bit. Um, and it's essentially falling apart, like an, uh, like an unraveling tapestry, which is how come there's lumps of gold in the poo. Originally there weren't. And they meet this guy, his name is Krivu, they love him, he's a recurring character. And that entire thing came up because they wandered off into the woods when I didn't think they were going to come off the road because I stressed that the woods were dangerous as crap. <laughs> like the, the only remotely safe place was the road and that that wasn't safe. I just assumed I could keep them corralled on the road. They're new players, I should have known better. So I pulled a gold bear out of my butt. <laughs> and, they, and they loved it. <laughs> um, they immediately wanted to learn how to cast that spell. <laughs> like, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and one day I got really, one of my horror stories, I got really lucky about it. They, they, they came across, uh, a te they came across a small hamlet. Uh, that I didn't have names for the NPCs, the town, nothing. I, I just, I called it Bob Town and conjured up an NPC named Bob. And that the town was called Bob Town because he was the first person to live there that he or anyone else in the village recalls. And he was like 30. And this made no sense. Zero sense. In, in a game where characters are named Zoltan and Avelios and things like that. <laughs> And I got really lucky because the players loved it. Like, they wrote that on their map. They love Bob. He's like a buddy. <laughs> but I was so ashamed. <laughs> I felt so guilty. Uh, so, I, I, see, for me, you, your, your story where you just essentially pull, pulled two shopping centers in a row and no plot progression, when compared against the sprite, that is such a better return that I would totally take the risk every time. <laughs> Absolutely. That, yes, is, that is awesome. I don't have a recurring sprite. I should. <laughs> uh, that, that's really cool. A tree where they don't actually hang all the way. <laughs> what, what a cool yeah. idea. So is, is there anything about improv GMing, any specific aspect of it that you, that you lose grip on? Like I, I suck with coming up with names. Oh, gosh. I am known for, like, stopping in the middle of a sentence and saying, hold on, I have to pull up a name generator. <laughs> so my, my PCs, they'll walk up to, like, a random guard, and they'll say, hello, name generator, and then... That's funny. <laughs> they'll continue the conversation while I pull up a name. That's funny. I, I tend yeah. to... I improv almost everything. Uh, we're starting a new system on Sunday... Whole new cast of characters, right? Completely different feel, um, and my entire notes are, you know, those fancy notebooks you can get that have like resin covers of a dragon or something. Those pages are pretty yeah. small. I have w half of one of those. Those are my notes. That's it. Um, <laughs> that's all I'm gonna need. I hope. <laughs> I, I just kind of have faith that the players will create the 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 br mental breadcrumbs I need to make the game exciting for me. And they, they usually do. Um, I, I have an argument that Drew Carey is a badass GM. Like, from whose line is it anyway? Because yep, everybody, everybody gets a character. Like, they get three sentences, right? Maybe less. Horny Dog has been a character on that show that's two words, right? <laughs> like, everybody gets a character. Drew Carey sits behind the counter, paints a scene, off you go. <laughs> like, sounds like a great game of D&D &D to me. 
Um, but improv, I think, is, is difficult for some people and really scary. And I just, I suck with names. So I have a list of names that I've seen on TV or written in a book or generated or whatever, like a little notepad with a bunch of names on it. And I scratch one off when I use it and then write what that person is now. And that's it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I just suck at names. Is there anything in improv you're particularly good at that you just do effortlessly? Oh, uh, I guess just threading one story into the next. Um, oh yeah, that's a cool talent. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty handy, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I guess I think I'm, I'm probably pretty good at um, being able to lead into the next thing. Sort of like how finding the mother leads into the bodyguard, leads into the obelisk, leads into the sprite, leads into... Uh, I, I mean, these are all things that just came to me naturally and then ended naturally. That's really cool. I was completely lost when you said, and there's an obelisk. <laughs> because I've had a, a couple of sessions in the past. My players are, whenever I, they're a list of senses that if I say them, they're going to tense up immediately. Uh, mm. when, I go, when I go click, I'm going to need more dice when I start counting down from 10. But probably the scariest thing ever is when I say you can't hear anything. I'm really, really fond of using sound to help paint the world. There is nowhere where there are people where there is no noise. (laughs) So if if there's no sound, that means either that somehow you found a portion of the planet that has been untouched by civilization, or much more likely, something has killed everything that makes noise. (laughs) Which is basically every... Which is basically everything that moves. Um, yeah. Uh, so improv, I don't know. Is there a thing I'm good at? Um, uh, vocal tics. Making NPCs interesting to picture. I Like, uh, I like to have guys... I don't necessarily do a lot of voices, per se, but I like to do vocal tics. This one squares every other word. This one, at the end of every sentence, at the beginning of every sentence, will take 30 seconds to actually spit it out. Because he'll, he'll be too busy going, what was I saying again? Like I, like, I love to do things like that. And those are, those are easy for me. But the, the idea of being to effortlessly weave a story into another one, I would trade my ability for your ability, hands down. <laughs> That's really cool. <sighs> I mean, I wish I could do verbal takes or even accents a little better, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I occasionally have a guard, right? Like, oi, who goes there? And one of them looks at me and goes, really? That's... You might have seen that meme going around <laughs> recently. Really? That's supposed to be the city sure. guard? Of course. Why did the guy have this ridiculous accent then? I actually do that, and it's fun. <laughs> Uh, I blame Spike from the, the Buffy t- from the Buffy TV show, that time where he's being hunted and he's pretending to not be who he is and he goes, I am a friend of Xander's then. <laughs> uh, so this has been great. Is, is there anything, any aspect of, of not, pre- not prepping or prepping you wanted to talk about that we haven't covered yet? Um... No, I don't think so. That covers almost all of my notes. Not that I have many. I was like, you brought notes? Good for you. (laughs) Yeah, I have a note card, actually. That's awesome. That's awesome. So this has been great. Thanks so much. And there you have it. Improv, prep, maybe a little bit of both. Do you have great stories about preps that you had in the past? Do you have great stories of times where you're like, you know what? I don't want to prep. I don't feel like prepping. I don't want to. Whatever. And you ended up with really cool improv NPCs or a cool story because I want to hear it. Let me know in the comments below. Later days.